Okay, so uh, today I thought I'd just walk through the, the conceptualization of a runtime library for D um, with consideration for the fact that it's a, it's a language with a very broad appeal. So um, without further ado, uh, first I just thought I'd really quickly uh, skim over the, uh, the actual features of the language just to demonstrate the fact that you know, so many different people like it. Uh, it obviously appeals to C programmers as pointers in line assembly, uh, direct calling of C code. And at the same time, it has a lot of features that are popular for uh, languages like Java, Ruby, and things like that. Uh, garbage collection, built-in dynamic and associative arrays. It has uh, UTF conversions for uh, for each loops and things like that. Therefore, uh, users come to D with uh, really diverse backgrounds and expecting a whole lot of different things. Uh, you have you know, the Java programmers or people who just want to write scripts for their IT thing. You know, it might be a one-off script that they want to spend five minutes on that's going to solve some problem really quickly. And those people really just don't want the language to be very complicated. They want to sit down, write a function, have things work, and, and that be it, and have things pr behave predictably, and uh, really, not, uh, really not have any surprises for you know, strange corner cases and things like that. And the other t uh, on the other hand, you have people doing embedded programming and uh, systems programmers who are very specific. Some people might want, you know, have a very specific limit on the number of bytes that the program can occupy or the memory layout. And uh, some systems, pro uh, systems programs can really benefit from very detailed information about the architecture of the system. They may want to know, you know, uh, various profiling options. They may want control over low-level features because D has um, garbage collection and things like that. You know, a systems programmer may want a garbage collection cycle to only last a certain amount of time or something like that. So, uh, the compiler writer, because of all of the you know the magic features of D. Um, the language pretty much has to have a runtime, unlike C, where you can pretty much get away with saying, all right, this is going to compile directly to assembly code, and you know, if I don't use library code, it's just not going to be, uh, be in my program at all. Uh, D, there has to be support for array, array resizing, uh, associative array operations, garbage collection, array sorting, and things like that. Uh, so you really can't get around the fact that some code that the user didn't write and probably isn't aware of or, you know, doesn't care about is going to be linked into his application. On the other hand, you have the library developer who's going to be focusing on all of the user accessible features, uh, such as, you know, obviously thread management because synchro uh, the synchronized keyword is a part of the language, but then also things like error handling, I.O., text output, and all of the other stuff that is in a standard library that people typically use. So the first cut, uh, just the traditional monolithic library. You know, sit down and say, all right, we want features X, Y, and Z in this library, and we're just going to put them all in, and, and that's going to be it. And uh, so the simplest division is, you know, you'll almost definitely have a compiler team and a library team working closely together to develop all of these features. The library team is going to write the thread code and the I.O. code and things like that. And the compiler team is going to be handling the actual compiler writing and plus any runtime features that are uh, necessary to support that. Um, like array resizing and all the other things that I mentioned before. So because this is a monolithic library, uh, the team interaction has to be uh, fairly close uh, because of the way some of these features work, like uh, the thread, thread routines have to interact with the garbage collector uh, and some other things like that. The compiler people can't just sort of go off and write, uh, you know, write their stuff and have the standard library, pe library people go off and write their stuff and have everything just magically work at the end of the day. Uh, there has to be some communication back and forth to make sure that the garbage collector knows how to call the thread, uh, the thread library and things like that. Uh, however, as an advantage, uh, the monolithic library, well, an advantage and a disadvantage, I would say, uh, of a monolithic library is that all of the code that you may want to use for anything, be it for runtime purposes or for standard library purposes, is all going to be in the same place. So uh, 
one example might, that I know has come up before in the D forums has been um, reporting of unhandled exceptions. So if you throw an exception out of the, out of the user program, it's going to be caught by the standard library, and an error message is going to be printed to the screen saying, this is what happened, this is the line it was on, and things like that. And the most natural way to approach that is, you know, I.O. features that someone's written. In a monolithic library, that may, may be, you know, printf from C, or it may be, you know, C++ I.O. streams or some big fancy thing. You know, ultimately, if, if uh, whoever's working on the runtime isn't really thinking very carefully about, you know, dependencies and things like that, they could end up pulling in a huge portion of the library by using formatted I.O. routines just because it's, you know, the thing that's most easily available. Uh, so that's something that has to be consideration for uh, particularly a monolithic library design because, um, well, I guess I should move on. We'll get to it in a minute. Oh, well, maybe not. Okay. So the second cut, uh, given the fact that um, because uh, team interaction tends to be complex, it, it, you end up spending a lot of man hours just trying to figure out, well, okay, you know, what's Joe doing over here? All right, well, the interface of his thing changed because he doesn't, you know, whatever, it's going to throw this exception now. And so you have to go back and forth. And uh, with a monolithic library, you end up having to synchronize, you know, uh, let's say the release of the compiler runtime with the standard library. And, you know, if the, if the language is changing, the library isn't actually changing, you end up still having to release the entire thing together. So the most natural... Uh, way to, to deal with this problem is just to say, all right, we're going to take the compiler runtime and separate it out from the standard library and just formalize the way that the two interact with one another. So if the language changes or if the standard library changes, we can just go ahead and release one component or the other component without really having to, um, you know, release both together. And for large companies, you know, they may have to uh, test the software to, you know, make sure that some new release didn't introduce errors that they weren't uh, that didn't exist in the prior one that causes problems and things like that. So uh, the two components in this uh, in this design are the language support routines and the standard library routines. And in order to uh, avoid any dependencies, uh, compile time dependencies, it's necessary really to limit the interaction to things that can be defined just by their signatures. Uh, well, yeah. Like uh, XTRMC functions, structs, which have a, a guaranteed binary layout, simple data types like integer and float and things like that. So um, this is the first, uh, because we're splitting this thing out, as I mentioned before, the garbage collector has to work together with the thread library to ensure that um, you know, can stop the world at the beginning of a collection, run its collection, and then start things up again at the end. And whereas before it might be possible for the garbage to collector to call, you know, import thread, call thread, dot suspend, and this and that and the other thing, in this case, uh, because we don't want to have any compile time dependencies between the runtime and between the standard library code, we have to define functions to do the, uh, essentially the same thing. And so in this case, We've got three. Uh, all of the functions in this case are X and C, and I just omitted it for convenience. Uh, so there's a function to, su to suspend all the threads, uh, a function where you pass a delicate, which is internal to the garbage collector, and it can go through and mark everything. And then a function that, uh, to call at the end to resume all the threads. Uh, the other major point of interaction is um, uh, the uh, error handling mechanism. A lot of places in the runtime uh, have to deal with language level errors, like array bounds exceptions and um, uh, case exceptions for switch statements and things like that. And to avoid any dependency on a specific exception hierarchy or exception object layout, uh, the easiest thing is to do as we did before with the thread library and define a bunch of functions that are called by the runtime for different exceptions. And just let the standard library worry about it. So if the standard library has one specific exception hierarchy, or if it wants to change something, or you know, maybe if it wants to provide some options so the user can turn off certain exceptions for, for certain reasons, all of that can happen without changing the language or the, or the runtime at all. And so in this case, uh, I have three, uh, there are three functions 
uh, array bounds error, assert error, and out of memory error, all for handling different situations. And there are a number, number of other errors that I haven't, or a number of other functions that I haven't mentioned. But I uh, just wanted to give you an idea of, of how things interact. And so the third cut. After reviewing the, the, previous, the previous library design, one thing that was clear was that um, not, not everyone understands garbage collectors. Not everyone really knows how to write garbage collectors. And in a small team, trying to bring together the talent to write a garbage collector, a compiler, and all the standard library components uh, can be very difficult. Now, one option is to go to a third party uh, third-party source and say, all right, we want to use your garbage collector. Or we I did. Let's see. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, yeah, possibly. It, well, it, as you know, uh, array bounds errors and certain other errors aren't necessarily going to be called by the runtime anyway if you compile with debug versus uh, you know, on or off. Um, let's see if you use macros. Yeah. Yeah, you're still paying for the cost of a function call that may essentially say, oh, okay, should I throw an exception or not? No, okay, I'm going to do nothing. And yeah, that might be a problem. Um, yeah, it, it's possible that another option would be to eventually encapsulate all of this stuff into macros that do all of this detection and things like that. The, the real goal behind this design was to avoid, um, well, D, uh, from what I've seen, has a much stricter ABI than C++, C and C++ do. Uh, however, the layout of classes and things like that isn't really specifically defined. And um, I thought it would be really nice if it were possible for the compiler writer and the standard library developer and things like that to compile all of their code completely separately from one another and release it to the community and just you know let the user link that in whenever they're running their program and not have to worry about um, you know, recompiling and things like that. Uh, however, as you say, it may make more sense eventually to uh, have a layer between some of these function calls within the runtime or things like that uh, that use macros and do some kind of configuration to short circuit all of these, uh, some of this functionality before it actually passes through to, to do the same thing. Um, does anyone have any other questions so far? OK. So right. Uh, one of the other issues that's come up over time is uh, I've noticed there are a lot of people on the D forums who have been asking about different garbage collectors. And there's been a lot of research, and there are a lot of garbage collectors available for Java. Uh, however, actually integrating them into the Java runtime can be kind of difficult because you have this gigantic thing. and at least from what I've seen, there isn't a, a very easy way to just plug in a garbage collector and go. Um, team management also. So uh, one example of this is that uh, you know, where a user may actually want to switch garbage collectors based on needs uh, is normal applications. You don't really want to think about it. You might you know, allocate a bunch of dynamic, dynamic strings and Etc. And that's it. Uh, system programming or embedded programming may have uh, very specific requirements about how long a garbage collection cycle can take and things like that. And there are uh, some garbage collectors that are specifically designed for this purpose. However, they typically also require you to uh, specify how much memory the application is going to allocate, or you know, 
what percentage of CPU time you actually want to give the application as opposed to the uh, garbage collector. And since this isn't something that the normal user really wants to care about, uh, it's really preferable to give uh, the user the option rather than just force feeding them this garbage collector along with all of these other library components. So, right. Last thing is, um, because all of these things have been separated out, uh, the garbage collector does need some information from the runtime. And also, at the same time, the runtime really is the most, or the compiler writer really is the most uniquely suited to knowing the details about the target architecture. Uh, D currently only supports inline assembler for x86, for example. And I know GDC compiles on a whole slew of different platforms. And rather than trying some hacks to figure out what the stack top and bottom are, returning the address of a local variable and things like that, uh, it really is uh, a lot simpler just to simply ask the runtime about this. I mean, the compiler knows where the stack bottom is, the, but the top of the stack is, and it knows where the static data segments are. Uh, and uh, the current, in the current, well, in Phobos, the garbage collector has to figure all this stuff out. There's uh, in GDC and GPhobos, there are a bunch of version statements saying, oh, am I, am I running on this platform? OK, then I'll find the stack this way and all of that. And it's much simpler for a uh, garbage collector. Yes. Yeah, that's currently all in there in version statements for the uh, eventuality that <laughs> someday, uh, well, I guess in this case, Tango has to be ported to one of those platforms. Uh, but yeah, uh, from what you're saying, I guess that's something that has to be specified at com compile time, probably. I mean, you could do it at runtime, but then you end up having to do all of these extra tests in your code to figure out what kind of thing to run. So yeah, I guess in that case, the runtime could uh, provide a function to return that. And uh, I guess also it's worth noting that because uh, these function, you know, these function signatures are so simple, these could just as easily be turned into intrinsics. Uh, Stacktop, for example, could just, you know, compile directly to uh, one or two lines of, of assembly code, which is really a lot more convenient than having users do all sorts of funky tricks to figure out the exact same thing. Um, Finalize. I'll actually get into this one a little bit later, but um, that's in there because the uh, you know the compiler has different object layouts, and it may uh, different compilers may finalize objects in different ways. The second parameter is meant to indicate to the compiler whether the finalization occurring is uh, deterministic or not. Um, the basic idea is that the garbage collector may want to indicate to the runtime that it's finalizing objects as a part of a collection as opposed to uh, you know, an explicit deletion or something like that. And uh, we'll find out why a little bit later. Memory management interface, uh, I really just listed the functions here as, as oh, about half of them as an idea of, of some of the things that the garbage collector needs to expose. And I do think it's interesting that um, because of the current because the current mark uh, mark sweep collector performs its collections whenever it runs out of memory, the actual interaction between the runtime and the garbage collector is really pretty simple. It looks a lot like uh, the standard C memory allocation routines. You can allocate memory, free memory, uh, and then basically query the garbage collector for different information about memory blocks and, and things like that. But there isn't a whole lot as far as um, you know the nitty-gritty de details of you know oh I'm changing this pointer which might be required for an incremental collector and things like that. Okay, so at the end of all of this, we basically have three components. There are the language support routines written by the compiler writer. They handle things like array resizing, uh, associative array routines, sorting. UTF conversions and uh, the functions that I mentioned previously to return stack pointers and, and that sort of thing. There's also the garbage collector, uh, which I also showed uh, some of the, inter the interface for. And 
that's basically just in charge of handling memory allocation, um, scanning, etc. And the standard library. Uh, the standard library interface is really pretty thin as uh, relatively compared to the size of the library itself. And that interface at this point mostly amounts to error handling routines and thread management. So the first demonstration I'm going to walk through is a very simple replaceable garbage collector. Um, it uses the the existing Mark Sweep garbage collector from Phobos and, and from Tango also. And also provides a really simple garbage collector, if you want to call it that, that simply calls the uh, C malloc free and things like that. So no uh, garbage collection actually takes place. Uh, the advantage in this case is that the user can select one or the other at link time. And I suppose I can move my phone. Mm. So. So this is our garbage collector. Uh, I really only put the calls in here that actually have code as opposed to returning zero or something like that. And there's a memory allocation, two, three memory allocation routines and free, and that's all. And um, each one, if they end up getting a null pointer back from the C library, they just simply call on out of memory error, which tells the standard library that I don't have, you know, I didn't get memory back. Just do whatever you're supposed to do here. Uh, by default, that's going to throw an exception. But if the standard library wants to do something different, then it can. And here's our program. Uh, it's just a simple class that prints on construction and, de and destruction. And there are two uh, variables in main. One is, an, one is just a normal variable that should be collected by the garbage collector because the value is being set to null. And the other one is scoped, so it should actually be explicitly deleted by the runtime when, uh, when main goes out of scope. And so here's our, our simulated command line. Um, GC basic, that is the mark sweep garbage collector. GC malloc is our little malloc garbage collector. And uh, let's see, Phobos lib is the runtime for uh, D DMD. And Tango Lib is basically the runtime for all of the language support features, thread control and error handling and things like that, but none of the other standard library components. So in the first example, or in the first case, we're going to compile explicitly the program against the Mark Sweep uh, garbage collector and the runtime we're using in this case. And we go ahead and run it. And what we see is really what we expect from an, an average D program. Um, from the previous slide, scope val is going to be constructed and deleted, and auto val is going to be constructed and deleted also. In the second case, we're doing the same thing, but we're compiling against our malloc garbage collector, which, does, which doesn't actually perform garbage collection. All it really does is allocate memory. And so in this case, both are constructed, but only scope, the scope uh, variable, which is explicitly deleted by the runtime, is destroyed. Uh, obviously, this is kind of a problem for the average application. But in some cases, you know, the 13K may matter. And in other cases, uh, well, it's really just a, an example of how easy it is to uh, to write and to integrate a different garbage collector into the language at link time rather than modifying code and recompiling the standard library and things like that. So yeah, in this case, we save 13K. If you really want to write D like C, you can. And that's it. This demonstration is a. Uh, You know, I kind of, I kind of thought a little bit about whether or not I should, I should actually do it because um, changing the destruction behavior of objects isn't something that people are always terribly fond of. Um, but I think it does illustrate an interesting idea and um, really just uh, emerge naturally from the basic philosophy as as defining all of these libraries and exposing uh, interfaces from them. And thinking about, well, all right, now that I have this runtime library that knows all of this stuff, 
you know, it's actually something I can talk to now rather than just this invisible thing going, you know, in the background that's, you know, doing all of this magical stuff when, it, you know, when I say new, uh, okay, it's actually allocating memory. It's not, you know, whatever, pulling things from the ether. So, uh, <laughs> so, now, that I, so now that I have this uh, runtime, well, what else does it know and what else can it tell me that I might actually be interested in? And the same thing uh, goes for the garbage collector. So in this case, uh, this is the uh, second parameter that I mentioned before, where you specify to the garbage collect to the compiler runtime when you're finali when you want it to finalize an object, whether that uh, object is being finalized in a deterministic or in a non-deterministic non manner, uh, basically whether it's being collected by the garbage collector, or whether it's being explicitly deleted. Um, and basically, what this finalize uh, method does, in addition to everything else, is uh, it calls uh, this routine in the standard library on collect resource to notify the standard library of a non-deterministic collection. Basically, every time the garbage collector collects something, it says to the standard library, OK, I'm, all, you know, I'm collecting this thing. Is there anything you want to do uh, special about this? And this is, a, this is as simple as I could make the code. The basic idea is that um, here we've actually uh, provided our own hook, rut hook routine that's called every time on collect resources called. I should just hit the space for it periodically, shouldn't I? <laughs> Something like that. Sorry, I can't turn off the screen today. Or the lock. Oh, that's fine. So. <laughs> Right. So the issue may, you mentioned before um, may be a concern for some people. You know, you're, we are going to be calling this function a whole lot potentially during collections, and most of the time it isn't actually going to be doing anything. However, that aside, um, the basic idea here is that the user has this object disposable um, that contains resources that, for whatever reason, you know, he wants to be handled differently if the object's being explicitly deleted versus uh, whether it's being collected by the garbage collector. Uh, in some cases, because of how um, garbage collection works, uh, typically you can't really refer to any of the objects that di uh, disposable refers to ever. Um, this can be kind of a problem. However, in this case, we say, all right, when this object is being explicitly deleted, go ahead and you know, call the dispose method on disposable to let it know that it's being deleted as opposed to being collected. So if there are other things it wants to do, say it's a queue and it has a bunch of, or a linked list and it has a bunch of objects beneath it, rather than just relying on the garbage collector to pick up all of them, it can go through and expli explicitly, explicitly delete them. And the same thing if it uh, guards a resource, like a file or something like that. So in this case, um, we destroy two different, two different ways. The first, we just construct one and go ahead and delete it manually. And the second time, we run a garbage collection, and that should actually collect the first object up there. And the execution is over to the right. In the first case, we see what we expected. Uh, the destructure is called in the delete case. In the second case, the dispose method is called. And how this actually happens in the on collect routine, um, it returns false if the runtime should not finalize the object itself. In some cases, uh, you can use the same approach for a kind of primitive le leak detection mechanism. Say, all right, I have all of these objects that contain resources, and I just want to make sure that my programmers didn't mess up and that they really are all going to, you know, they really are be all being explicitly deleted. For some reason, I'm not, I can't qualify them as scope because. You know, they have to be passed out of functions and things like that, but they still have to be explicitly managed. So in this case, you can do basically the same thing. You can go and say, all right, you know, if this class is of this type and it's being collected, then something's wrong with my program. So I'm going to print a message right here saying, this is happening. Someone needs to look at this. My last example is uh, kind of in the same vein in that it emerged as a. Uh, it emerged from the thought process of, 
all of these library components as providing interfaces to the user rather than you know, just working together behind the scenes. Uh, one of the issues that came up, um, I think Frank actually asked for it originally, uh, was a way to mimic the um, feature in Java where you can call object await and notify to kind of um, perform a, oh, right, to mimic condition variables. And really the most natural way to do that and, and the only way to do that at, at, first, at first blush is to go and say, all right, because, um, because the underlying mutex or lock and the condition variables have to interact, uh, in POSIX, actually, you have to pass the, the data back and forth, is um, to say, all right, I'm going to have the runtime return a pointer to this mutex object that's actually living in the monitor behind the class. And then the standard library can do with it whatever it wants to. However, the big problem with this is that it imposes restrictions on how the, on how the language works. It says to the compiler writer, well, you know, I don't care if you can do this faster using some kind of fancy spin lock or something like that. You have to use a mutex because I need it. Um, so, after giving this some thought, I realized that uh, an alternate approach is to basically say, "Okay, say to the runtime, this is how you, how the monitor object has to be formatted." Um, in this case, it's a struct. The first element it is required to be the size of a pointer, uh, an interface reference. And if that's non null, then just go ahead and call lock and unlock on that rather than doing whatever you would normally do when, when you deal with a, uh, you know, when you enter and leave a synchronized block. And so in this case, all you're really paying for is um, the size of a pointer, and that's really it. So then if the user, for whatever reason, wants to over override the behavior of a normal, um, of a normal object monitor, uh, in this case, for just normal mutexes and condition variables, but uh, also, you can do things like create uh, shared monitors for inter-process communication and things like that. You can go ahead and say, all right, you know, I'm going to attach this little struct to, uh, to my object, and it's going to act as a proxy for my actual um, monitor. So this is just a demonstration of what the code actually looks like, um, the act of pointer manipulation and things for, for actually uh, overriding the monitors a little, bit, a little bit complicated. But the basic idea here is that we have a uh, mutex object that was constructed in the, in the standard library that has no knowledge of anything about how the runtime works. And yet it can be used uh, within a language feature, uh, in this case the synchronized statement, when synchroni the synchronized synchronize block is entered mutex, uh, the lock method of mutex is going to be called, and when synchronized block is exited, the unlock method is going to be called. And because in this, uh, because in this case the condition object is aware of the mutex and things like that, the two can interact completely in the standard library without any knowledge of how the runtime works. And I think that's probably my last slide. So, I guess I'd just like to wrap up by saying that um, really the advantage of, of modularizing certain portions of the library that, library that typically aren't, um, aren't given much attention I think really has a tremendous advantage, especially in a language like D that has a, a great appeal to C programmers and C++ programmers. Um, who may have very specific requirements about how their application works. And, um, oh, yeah, I guess that's about it. So. Do you have a concrete example of uh, library mutexes something more sort of would help? How they would help? Yeah, well, this is a, <laughs> this is, this is as, as simple as I could still down a, a distill a, basic uh, producer-consumer model. So in this case, the first block is, is uh, waiting for something. It's waiting for information. And the second block is passing that information. Uh, I guess the most concrete example would be 
uh, let's say there's certain report, um, there's something receiving data from the, from the network saying, all right, it's assembling messages, XML messages, or something like that. And when they're complete, it's going to pass them on to another part of the program that's in charge of processing them. And so both of these are operating in separate threads. Uh, the bottom one would be the one who's actually sitting there on the socket, reading data and assembling it into a buffer. And when that data is done, it just goes ahead and notifies a thread pool or something else that the data is available. Um, What do you mean? <clears throat> oh, well, really just that it allows, uh, in this case, the condition variable to be implemented. Um, I thought long and hard about just going ahead and, and adding object wait and object notify directly into the runtime. But it really adds a lot of complexity to the runtime, and it, it ended up creating um, certain dependencies I wasn't really entirely happy about. Uh, for one thing, it ends up saying, you know, that no matter what platform this or no matter what platform D is running on, it has to support these features. And um, condition variables weren't something that I thought would potentially be supported everywhere, particularly on embedded pro uh, embedded. Pro embedded systems that might not have multi-threading multi and things like that. So I thought for now it was just simply a lot more prudent to go ahead and implement all of this stuff in the standard library and to do so in a way that doesn't create dependencies between the standard library and the runtime. Yeah? The, the real advantage with, with really uh, exposing all of these methods in the runtime is to make language features more uh, universally, universally useful. I think you're probably going to talk about um, the uh, unit testing stuff maybe a little bit. No? OK. Uh, one of the other things I didn't, I didn't talk about was um, using the same method the runtime, uh, when the runtime is initializing, it actually calls a uh, routine to tell the standard library, OK, you know, I'm starting up. Just go ahead and run any unit, unit tests that are in the program. Normally, this is handled all in the runtime, and you can't really control it. But the problem is then that the language feature is really limited. You say, all right, every time this program runs, if unit tests exist, they're going to run. If they fail, the program doesn't run. And you know, if they succeed, the program is going to run, and that's it. Um, one thing a lot of people seem to ask for, uh, Greg, Gregor in particular, is uh, just to, to make the unit testing more useful. You know, sometimes you might want to test an application without actually running it, and sometimes you might want to recover from unit test failures to continue testing so you could generate a complete report of what's wrong in an application without, um, without you know, running, stopping, running again once you fix the problem, stopping again, and, and so on. And so in this case, I uh, using a similar method as the callback, similar to onCollect, um, the runtime says, OK, go ahead and run all these unit tests. And the standard library uh, actually performs the unit testing itself. It iterates through all of the module, inf module info and calls everything, and then just tells the runtime, OK, now go ahead and start the application. Uh, the user has the option of overriding this and can also indicate to the runtime, OK, I'm done. This was just a test run, so don't start the application at all. Anything else? Can I like compare it to the uh, BC stack bottom stack top 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Well, the, the reason those two methods were originally conceived was um, mostly for library portability. Um, and at the time, and I haven't tested this recently, so I can't be sure, at the time, the, the routine to get the pointer to the stack bottom sometimes returned null if you were calling it from within a thread. And so it wasn't something that I really wanted the, the standard library to rely on at the time. So while the two, while the two functions exist, the only one I act is actually being used in Tango itself is the stack top one. The bo stack bottom one is there uh, mostly for convenience. Um, but yeah, that is, that is actually a pretty good idea. And, and eventually I should go back and double check that things actually work the way they should and maybe just have it be similar to a, let's see, be similar to scan static data where you just basically pass it a delegate and say, okay, go ahead and run this delegate on whatever memory range you know about. Yeah, no worries.